like so thank you very much to the organizers i the the talk is slightly slightly shorter than i announced now uh, well i try to say something which so basically it links very nicely with the with the last talk and the first one in the morning a little bit i mean something about uh, say three plus one geometry but i basically i say about i just present one toy example toy model in a in a way of some sort of an evolution, and then I say a lot about a problem. We can, I mean, we're able to see that there are some problems, and I maybe just comment something like that. Okay, so this is basically the schedule. The schedule is something like that. Well, first let me talk about motivation and some sort of general understanding. So the question is, I mean, in the name non commutative geometry, there's geometry. So what is geometry? So I think, I mean, if we want to do geometry, we need to understand what geometry is. And classically, I mean, basically, I mean, in this setup, it, what we mean is differential geometry. So there are two things about ge differential geometry. One is quite rigid. So when you say, I mean, you have a manifold, you know what it is, basically. So it's rigid, and you can describe spheres in any dimension, tori, different, you know, objects, uh, just name it. And this thing is quite universal. So you can describe quite a lot of things using the very same language in the very same tools. So you, if you say a differential calculus over a manifold, differential forms over a manifold, you don't need to specify what it is because the notion is rigid. But on the other hand, I mean, it's very, very universal. You can describe a lot of things using that. So this is the first thing. And you know, I mean, you, you have bundles, you have Sub-bundles, principal bundles, group action, manifolds, sub-manifolds, everything. You can make sense of, talk, of, you know, talking about some invariants. You can make sense of, uh, you know, classifying things, saying what is the, or at least asking relevant questions. I mean, what is the space of something? So basically, you can pose meaningful questions, and those meaningful questions, I mean, well, you know, I mean some of the conjectures, long-standing conjectures, or open event problems in differential geometry are, you know, are there. I mean, same thing, I mean, for the objects that we are interested in, like Dirac operators. I mean, you can ask meaningful questions. I mean, so take manifolds, take Dirac operators, for instance. I mean, what is the lowest eigenvalue? What, are, what is the behavior of eigenvalues? And so on and so forth. But sometimes, even, and this is, you know, one of the beautiful things in geometry, you can answer these questions. And this is, I think, I mean, this is what it's all about, what mathematics is all about. Now, I mean, since this part of the workshop is more, is, is related to physics, mathematical physics, so the question is, well, what is the relation with physics? And of course, the relation with physics is very simple. I mean, basically all of the classical physics, or most of the classical physics as we know it, say mechanics, is based on differential geometry in one sense or other. <laughs> well, yes, but I mean, okay, I mean, but if you, if you, if you say about, if you, if you ask the question, so say the question of the you know, motion of planets, something like that, you know, classical, classical mechanics in, in this <coughs> sense, I mean, this is basically differential geometry. Well, quantum physics, I mean, maybe quantum physics would be more probability and all that, uh, something like that. <laughs> yeah, 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 statistical physics. Uh, oh, yes, the statistical physics is, yes. But then it would be related also to quantum physics. So quantum physics, in the sense we know, learn at school or something like that. I mean, like you take a Schrodinger equation, Schrodinger operator and all that. This is a mixture, and it's a mixture of Differential geometry, because I mean, basically what you're doing, I mean, you're taking the operators that you know from differential geometry, partial derivatives, derivatives, I mean, Laplace operators, something like that. You put somehow different meaning to it, and you understand them more as operators in the sense of operator algebra, so operators acting on some Hilbert space. So there's a slight difference, but basically, I mean, this is, there's a relation between all of them. So this is, this, this is where we stand, and this is what geometry maybe should mean, and the geometry, I mean, how it's, you know, understood now and how it's related to physics. 
Now, of course, I mean, geometry, when you, when you say, I mean, all of the classical physics, I mean, classical mechanics, but also, you know, classical field theory. If you go to field theory, I mean, all of Young Mill's theory, for instance, this is nothing like geometry of principal bundle and connections of principal bundle. Now, why extend the geometry? So, first, I mean, I would say about th three approaches to it. The first approach is you extend the geometry and look at the consequences. And that's been, you know, this is, you know, the, what people doing mathematical or theoretical physics do. Basically, they extend the geometry. So when you have one group, you look for a bigger group. When you, you know, run out of group, you look for supergroups. So we, when you ra run out of classical symmetries, you look for supersymmetries. Uh, well, when you board with points, I mean, you look for strings. I mean, and this, that's how it goes. I mean, you ex add something more in the, I mean, extending notion of, that we know, I mean, notion of a Lie group, notion of a Lie algebra extended by Lie super algebra, Lie super group, manifold, super manifold, and so on and so forth. Strings, brains, whatever. Second approach, well, you look up what the geometry is and try to describe it. And that's what people have been also do, trying to do. You know, you look up what is the geometry that you, could, that, you, that you encounter in the world. And basically, it's, you know, sort of boring, but anyway. And try to describe it. I mean, just that's the approach, you know, that's also, you know, been somehow, somehow advocated non-commutative geometry. I mean, namely, you look at the data with, say, standard model, and you make the interpretation of it, or make the interpretation of maybe some cosmological data, or data from whatever experiments that you might have at hand, including, you know, for instance, this quantum poly effect or whatever, and then try to make the geometric sense of the, out of the data. And of course, there's a third approach. You just ignore everything. I mean, <laughs> just make it for fun. Still, I mean, I try to stress it, and this is, you know, sort of a motivation that I'm looking at. Geometry, I mean, even non-commutative geometry, should be a notion large enough to include, every, well, something we know. So basically, you know, classical differential geometry, classical manifold, so commutative manifolds, as you, as we say. And extend nicely to some non-trivial examples. So if you have at hand an example that you have, that you believe should be described nicely by this extension, I mean, could be non-committed torus, quantum groups, fractals, finite spaces, matrices, whatever. But then it should be rigid enough in a sense that we don't need to, you know, say, OK, for a non-committed torus, we need this notion of geometry like that. But if you go to fractals, we need to take this. I mean, if we're talking about geometry, it should be more or less, some people would say more or less in a rather big sense, one notion. So it should be something that is, you know, rigid enough. So this is some sort of an approach that I'm advocating against. This is, you know, behind that's motivating what I've done. Now, we've had. You know, this definition, we've seen this definition many times. So this proposition for the notion which would be rigid enough or, say, you know, large enough, big enough, you know, to say something, to, to have everything, is the one of sexual triplism. And I just, you know, flashed those five. Yeah, I mean, the point five here is, you know, nasty conditions, say, of analysis type or whatever, I mean, operator algebraic type or, I mean, functional analysis type. So basically, I mean, the, the spectral triple is a little bit more than a triple, I mean, but basically it's an algebra, which we understood, understand as operators in a Hilbert space, bounded operators in a Hilbert space. And this algebra should be, you know, good enough, whatever it means. Then you have, uh, well, this Hilbert space, basically separable Hilbert space, and then an unbounded operator with some very nice conditions and a lot of other things that intertwine between this operator, Hilbert space, and the algebra. Now, you've seen this definition in many, so to say, versions, or maybe one version which just says, well, you have this A, B. Sometimes you might have this J. Sometimes you might say, well, the J is not good enough. So this is one thing. The second thing is, that, I mean, you might look, you might have seen this 
or the one condition. Also, in other disguises, I mean, you can you can reformulate it, you can formulate it quite differently. Sometimes you say, well, this first order condition is not good enough, and we know of examples that you cannot actually satisfy. So this is one of the things. So you might wonder, I mean, what really, I mean, the good definition is. Then, of course, I mean, I what I what I've not written, I mean, are those conditions that are for instance, necessary for the reconstruction theorem, which, I mean, could be, well, in one version, some sort of either Poincaré duality or this co at least this co-cycle condition, something that distinguishes classically between manifolds or and orbifolds and so on and so forth. Now, we know very, very few genuine non-commutative examples that this is satisfied. And also the reconstruction theorem, I mean, has its very, very specific version of it. Okay, so this, then you've had this theorem basically saying that, okay, I mean, if you have something classical, then this, this is fine. And there's this reconstruction theorem which says that with many, many other conditions, I mean, you can basically reconstruct it. Well, there will be some bats, bats to it, so there's some uh, uh, limitation of that. But roughly speaking, I mean, we might, you know, pose question whether this is a good notion of a geometry. I mean, this is, you know, point to study. Maybe, you know, the geometry, I mean, is, you know, this is an attempt to formulate such. All right, but taking this, I mean, you might ask yourself, what are the examples? So there's this reconstruction theorem. Well, I mean, that's what basically said. I mean, it's the reconstruction theory is very restrictive. And, okay, I mean, the, the, the bus, I mean, so uh, the bus come now. Uh, for instance, I mean, you say about Dirac operator and then you reconstruct something like a Dirac operator, but there's no way, no way that I know of that you can say in a nice, so to say, algebraic or basically construct way of constructing that you get something that, I mean, for instance, has no torsion. So when you construct a connection, you construct a Dirac operator that has no torsion. Or even in higher dimensions, something that you have no word for it. Because, I mean, the torsion is only one part of it, and in higher dimensions, say dimension 123, you might have something which, in, which, which has no classical counterpart. So, uh, then there's, there's something else. I mean, if you have this definition, it's very, very nice, and uh, but it's limited. I mean, for instance, I mean, the, the limitation is that there's no good description in this language, I mean, of something which are principal fiber bundles. There is an algebraic description of that. And the algebraic description uh, I will mention also later on, I mean, which is uh, using the, the, the notion of hopf galois extension. But this is, you know, it's not very, very uh, uh, clear that one can, you know, make generally, in general, I mean, those two things, I mean, this sort of special triple description uh, compatible with the other one. I will come back to that. So, the thing is, I mean, for instance, I mean, there, there's an interesting thing. If you relax some of those conditions, so for instance, one knows that this first order condition, I mean, to make something which is workable for the quantum group, SU2, for the Q, SUQ2, you need to relax this condition slightly, replacing this zero on the right hand side, but saying that it's small, small in a way, compact, and basically in a very interesting idea of compact operators on the Hilbert space that one's working with. Now, you might play the game and say, I mean, if you relax this condition classically, what happens? And, I mean, you, you might work it out. And for instance, I mean, you, this is whole model, I mean, you can work it out for the two-dimensional sphere, and you might end up with a Dirac type operators on a two-dimensional sphere, which are equivariant with respect to the SU2, just the usual rotations, and uh, which are not differential, but pseudo-differential operators, which represent different k-homology classes. So, I mean, this is, you know, this is the game you're playing. But, but your pseudos will be of order at least one? Yeah, this is our order one. Of course. Yeah, yeah, of course, this is order one, but they, they have zero order, yeah, but they, so yeah, exactly, they, they, they are not differential operators. Yeah, yeah, but the, then, I mean, the first, order, I mean, it's also true that the first order condition is satisfied 
up to compass. So I mean, this is like playing the game. And actually, I mean, the order of the compact is the order of the inverse. So basically, I mean, this is like like it. So what are the examples? And this is, you know, the challenge that we have. And I'm also saying it. You know, we have the challenge is that we have too few examples. Because the examples that we have is, they you know, basically, the first example ever given and always, you know, repeated with one exception, I mean, uh, is the non-commutative torus. And basically, you know, I mean, one says you end up coming to the torus, and you have this fantastic Dirac operator that comes from two derivations, so long lived flat Dirac operator. I mean, this is the only one we knew. I mean, of course, I mean, there'll be a correction to that. I mean, thanks to the works of many, I mean, we know a little bit more. But I mean, so far, I mean, just open any or more, most of the books. I mean, that's it. I mean, a little bit boring, I would say. Interesting, but though boring. Finite dimensional algebras, well, matrices are cool. I mean, since something like more than 100 of years. But, uh, you know, if you ask physicists, I mean, talk to physicists and talk to them. Well, you know, we go do things with algebras and we use the language of spectral triples. Uh, they'd be fascinated. Really. I mean, they would say, yeah, okay, I mean, these are matrices. We know this, I mean, since 19th century, basically. That's, that's it. I mean, so, I mean, we need to look for some, something more. Now, quantum groups and quantum spaces, homogeneous spaces, this is a real challenge. They neither, of course, they neither quantum nor group. But I mean, as, I, I mean, as you look it up, I mean, you know, when you look at the spaces, well, we, you know, okay, sphere is different from torus, but basically, in two dimensions, you can classify our topological spaces. Well, a little bit more difficult in three, a little bit more difficult in four. But I mean, if you look at this, so okay, groups. I mean, basically, you can you can you can you can you can, you can classify. I mean, Lie groups. I mean, uh, homogeneous spaces. You can also you know say something about. But when you look topologically, for instance, at a quantum sphere, at a quantum SU two, and all the quantum groups, they basically compact plus something. So I mean, from the point of view of operator algebra, and especially if you take this point of view that you know compact operators is something you know negligible. This is you know sort of infinitesimal in in, 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 in the sense. Then basically, I mean, they, I wouldn't say they're boring because they might have interesting geometry, but they're looking at the geometry of a infinite well of, of basically something like zero. I mean. Well, top. Sorry. Uh, you, you, of course, you can have more structure. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying, but you know, topologically, for instance, I mean, you know, spheres are, you know, of course, I mean, this is this is might be the interesting thing, you know, algebraically, I mean, this is okay, but then there's, this, you know, there's also sort of a discrepancy, because, uh, for instance, I mean, if you look at the quantum sphere, I mean, topologically, I mean, the standard standard sphere is, is point plus compact, right? And of course, I mean, the, the thing is, I mean, if you look at the algebra of polynomials in the generators, there's one algebra. And I mean, the, for instance, the good question is to find the algebra that sits between, in between, which would correspond to something like the smooth algebra. And this is a challenge. I mean, I, I'm not saying that's not a challenge. I mean, this is a challenge. But the for instance, yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I know this is interesting. But the thing is, I mean, you need to, you know, uh, I mean, for the, for the standard for the sphere, for instance, I mean, where one can play the game of the spectral triple, even though, I mean, at least not all the conditions are satisfied. For, for if you take a family of other, other for the spheres, I mean, then, then, you know, you cannot satisfy the other one condition. And you have different Dirac operators. So, you know, this is a challenge. Then, of course, why are the formation, which is fantastic, but we are basically back to quantum mechanics. And there's another thing which is also very fashionable, maybe in this, not here, but at some other meetings, and if there are pe people from the Parameter Institute here, they know it, which is the uh, so-called kappa deformation, which is basically known in the world of doubly special relativity, and thanks to Marco Matassa, I mean, we have a notion of spectral triple on it. Though, I mean, what one can say, I mean, again, what do we do? We change the geometry slightly because this is a notion of twisted spectral triple. All right. 
Who? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I mean the, the the thing is, you know, that you know, you know, you know, you know, Fidela, I mean, the question is, I mean, whether we want to do physics or mathematics. This is one thing. If you want to do mathematics, I mean, you would, I mean, you what you would like to have probably is one notion that all these examples fit in. Yeah. Exactly, and this is, and this is this is what I what I'm worried because I mean what I'm worried a little bit. I mean this is I'm not saying you know it's all wrong, but what I'm saying is a challenge, and the challenge is the following: you know, find a common language. Because I know that, for instance, in differential geometry, when I take a principal fiber bundle, it doesn't matter whether I take a as a I mean to describe it. I know how to describe it, no matter which group which Lie group I take. Could be U U1, S U2. As you five, whatever, uh, an exceptional group, I know how to describe it. That's not the same thing here. So here, the notion of geometry, you know, is not that rigid. I mean, in this thing. I mean, in those examples. And so I'm worried about examples because, I mean, well, I can say also I will mention one example, which I believe m needs to be a fantastic example of non-commutative geometry, which, which which creates some problems. And this is also related to the last. Okay, so how to uh, there's another thing, how to construct such examples. Well, you sit comfortably, think about it, and then you have it. I mean, there's, there's no other way. Is there? No. Very good. So what are the meaningful questions we can ask? So the questions are basically dependent on what we want to describe, what we want to know, so what are the real problems. So for instance, I mean, can we describe the families of objects? So the relevant questions that one can ask is, for instance, I mean, suppose you take a non-commutative torus. Everybody believes this is a sort of fundamental or a motivating example. So fine, you have the notion of a spectral triple on a non-commutative torus or non-commutative tori. Describe all spectral triples. Now, even in the equivariant version, that's been, I mean, for the two-dimensional case, been done by myself, Mario Pashkin, when we said. When we, when we found that there are four equivariants, which correspond to the spin structures, and then by generalized by fantastic work by Yannis de Wenzelar, who did it for n and more generally. Now, so this is not only described, but then later on classified. But still, I mean, if you ask the question open, forget about being equivariant with respect to the obvious symmetry of the non commutative torus, I mean, just Say what are the or what are all spectral triples in whatever sense? I mean, on a non-commuted story. This is, a, I think, I mean, genuine, relevant, and fundamental question. So, can we classify those families of objects? Maybe this is, you know, sort of attempt, you know, reaching too far. But I mean, this, these are the meaningful questions. Now, there's another question. I mean, which is very, very interesting. So, can we bridge? I mean, you know, link. Some of the constructions that are purely algebraic, like I mentioned in the, I mean, the case of the Hopf-Galois extensions and connections on the principal bundles, with this approach, and exactly, I mean, this is this is one of the wh why it's interesting because there's a part of the knowledge, part of the information, for instance, about the Dirac operator on on principal fiber bundles that comes from the construction of a connection. So on one hand side. You have something which is purely, I mean, which, which could be understood as sort of more or less algebraic object linked to differential geometry and all that. And there's an algebraic description in the non commutative sense of that, thanks to, well, I mean, the mathematics side, I mean, Schneider and all uh, physics, well, sort of mathematical physics sides, uh, uh, Jean Magid, Tomek Zezinski, Piotr Hayat, and many, many others. And the thing is, 
can we build a bridge between those two? And uh, as far as I know, I mean, we've uh, tried, you know, to say something uh, first with Ludovic Dobrovsky and then his uh, student, Suka, I mean, about non-commutative circle and basically co-write boundaries on, on non-commutative spaces with an example of non-commutative torus. And then, I mean, surprisingly enough, I mean, you can do it. I mean, in this is example, paying the price, of course, I mean, assuming a little bit more, maybe than is necessary. But on the other hand, you can recover interesting examples of something, of some Dirac operators which haven't been considered before. All right. Well, I mean, and then, you know, finally the question, I mean, I mean, when you get to physicists, I mean, if you want to describe physics, I mean, can you get any number? There's one thing, Wemi, which relates to the talk uh, uh, before. There's, there's sort of tempting, you know, when you talk about physics and when you, when you, when you say, yeah, okay, we work with non committed space, the non committed space time, something like that. We want to describe space as non commuted. Now, there's a, now there are two questions. So first, I mean, say people, people ask, okay, how can it be? Would it be, you know, space non-commutative on large distances, small distances? How do you see it? So how can you mix sort of commutativity that we basically see or see as a sort of average maybe or whatever and some sort of deep down non-commutativity? And this is, uh, there's a question whether one can somehow mix those two things. And uh, there's, there's an example of something which could be called dimensional non-commutivity, and I will basically uh, say something about it a little bit more, because this is, for instance, one of the uh, traps, you know, where I think, I mean, so far, I mean, the, 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 the description in, the, in the terms of spectral triples, I mean, fails. I mean, fails means, I mean, hasn't been done. All right. So, and of course, I mean, it's fantastic that we can have some sort of toy models uh, where we use matrices, moyal, you know, cocycle deformations and so on. But I mean, we probably shouldn't forget that these are to toy models. So those questions uh, are uh, posed. So we can try, you know, to say whether we can solve them. And the, for instance, for a non commutative torus, I mean, we have a proposition what would be the space of, say, all Dirac operators? I mean, this is just, you know, a notion. I'm not claiming, you know, this is very original or this is the definite answer, but it's a proposition. So can we say this is, uh, I mean, something which we proposed and Ludwig talked about. I mean, can we say that this is a reasonable space of Dirac, and I mean Dirac, operators on a non commutative torus? And if yes, and if yes, then the question is, I mean, can we find a language to really, you know, describe it? So, and then the thing, the, the, the next question I mean, is, can we really compute something with that? So, for instance, I mean, that was, that was what was done. And uh, by many people, I mean, compute, you know, for instance, something like a, a, a Gauss bonus or some function and show that it's zero or non-zero computed value. And that's been done for this family, as, I, as, as Ludwig said, I mean, up to the uh, epsilon square only. So, and then we can, I mean, what is, for instance, I mean, the question for the non committed service, if you have those, all those examples of Dirac operators, I mean, can we identify them, link them by some transformation? I mean, like we know that for the two dimensional service in uh, the classical one, I mean, all, all metrics are related by some transformation, so something like that. And the, set, and the last thing, can we, can we make a leap towards something which one called 3 plus 1 geometry? Well, commutative time, and I mean, make some genuine models, I mean, models, again, toy models, I'm not saying anything deep, of something which is an evolution of non commutative geometry. I'm not trying, you know, as there were some remarks and during this week about, you know, and talks about Lorentzian stuff. I'm not, you know, trying to do Lorentzian stuff. Why? Uh, because uh, I think, you know, finding good word, I mean, it's not, 
in the end, when you try to you know, do something, and even in the end when you write Einstein equations, when you make you know, Lorentz and manifolds and everything, I mean, in the end, I mean, basically you want, to, you want to have this equation and solve it. You put some parameter time and you solve it. So, I mean, make it, you know, very, very primitive, very, very poor man's model of something like a non-commutative geometry which evolves in time. And I will also comment, I mean, what are the traps of that uh, connected with that. So, this is, this is what I'm concerned with and this is, you know, something, you know, very, very... So can we actually solve it to a model? And I will show you. I mean, you can actually solve it. So what are the spectral triple of a non-commutative torus? So the model will be non-commutative torus for obvious reasons, because I mean, this is you know benefiting from the work of many, in including those here in the room. So what is the spectral triple of non-commutative torus? I start with the flat spectral triple. You can make it on any n-dimensional torus, and I just you know flash the things because I mean this is not anything that uh, uh, is very original. And I mean, basically, almost everything, everyone knows it. I mean, the Dirac operator we take, I mean, just the flat operator, we take this real spectral triple to start with. So I mean, I think, I mean, this is one of the things that uh, uh, somewhere hidden, I mean, that, I mean, this reality, this J, I mean, you can call it J, I mean, what we really need is a representation of an algebra and, and the opposite algebra that commute with each other. But I mean, this J is just, you know, sort of maybe a decoy, but anyway. Well, we take an equivariant Dirac operator, so the flat Dirac operator that we start with. Now, we think about non-equivariant non Dirac operators, and this is, the, you know, the first candidate, I mean, that's been, again, you know, motivated by the work by Kohn Svetkov, then Kohn, Moscovici, Massoud, and uh, Fazizadek, and you know, probably many, many others. Uh, well, not that many, actually, yeah? No, 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 not that many, sorry, yeah. No, no, no more of your students working. Okay. Uh, of course, yeah. So, we fixed the dimension to be 4, for an obvious reason, because 4 is 3 plus 1, and I want to, you know, later on go to 3 plus 1. And of course, I mean, I'm not assuming anything about this theta. So, I mean, I can take, for a while, I mean, I can take this theta to be, you know, actually genuine non commuted torus in all directions. But I, I mean, what I'll be taking later on, of course, is one of these dimensions commutable. Anyway, so what is, we want to stay in the realm of spectral triplets. So I don't want to switch the geometry. Because, I mean, that's what I said. I mean, I want the geometry to be some sort of a rigid notion. So I want to be in a spectral triple. So basically, the only thing that can I won't say the only thing, but most of the things that can guarantee me, guarantee that the commutator of this with an element of the algebra is bounded, is that H is from the commutant of the algebra. So I mean, the statement is the other way around. If H is from the commutant of the algebra, then of course, then this thing has bounded commutators because D has. So, well. Then we can try to work out the functional, some reasonable functional that you know people in physics use in this case for such a Dirac operator, which I mean uses the calculus of pseudo differential operator developed by well Kontretkov, Konchamsudin, Kalhali, Fasizadev, and also present in the work in the work by Cyril Levy. Minute, I don't remember the first name and Sidney Page. All right, now. What I take as a functional, I take, I'm working in four dimensions, so this simplifies quite a lot. So I'm taking the, just the Wojcicki residue. I use the fact that on this pseudo differential calculus there's a Wojcicki residue. So I take this as a pseudo differential operator. I take d minus 4, which would be something like a volume of this non commutative manifold. And I take the inverse. The, the minus 2, so basically the inverse of the whatever, whatever generalized Laplace operator. Well, I mean, it's just a proposition. So I take something like a cosmological constant times the volume plus the whatever Einstein Hilbert action. Of course, of course, a word of caution. I mean, classically, well, I would know whether this really is a curvature or this really is something different. I mean, as I said, we are in dimension four. 
nothing really guarantees that this operator d a that I had here, so this is without torsion. I mean, I don't know. I don't even know what is torsion and commutative. So I mean, nothing would really guarantee that this is. I mean, one can expect that this might be the case, but nothing would really guarantee that this is, say, torsion free. So I'd be very, very cautious saying that this will give me something like an Einstein-Hilbert action. It could be Einstein-Hilbert Einstein action plus some torsion, which actually, you know, say that is age dependent. Well, that's it. So before you start complaining about those assumptions, I know this is, these are assumptions, so I know this might not be a minimal operator. There's not a good notion of minimal operator, but say there is. So minimal operator is the one operator is sort of genuine. It is. Oh, minimal operator is uh, is an operator that, I mean, you can define it the following way. You take a second order operator on a manifold, like Laplace operator, with the same principal symbol. A minimal operator will be an operator that minimizes the Einstein-Hilbert action. So basically, the Brodsky residue of, of, of its inverse. And you can show that in a classical case, this is, I mean, if you, if you take the genuine Laplace operator plus torsion with the connect plus torsion term, then, then, this, then this really minimizes. So th that's, I mean, this is, this is not a very, so to say, popular notion. So, cl so classically, we know that, for instance, this will be the case, but then commutatively, I, I don't know. I have no idea. Well, it is a very, very poor model. I mean, I'm, I'm not, you know, making claims, you know, to solve everything. I just take this model. I take this model just, you know, to look up what happens. So can I really, I'm sorry, this is the question, one of the, say, many meaningful questions maybe. And, I mean, what I'm looking, whether I can find, I, I can find some answer. So, of course, I mean, this is still very, very far from deriving general equations of motion because I'm taking not every possible Dirac operator, not every possible metric. I'm taking just a class. But, I mean, usually, I mean, this is something like, you know, pe what people do. You make some assumptions about the form of the metric, whatever, rotational symmetry or some sort of uh, robertson walker or whatever, and then you try to solve. So, well, at the moment, we see Euclidean. We make the leap later on. So, then you do the computation. I assume H is the, in the commutant, yeah. Uh, Absolutely, yes. But, but I mean, if I'm taking an operator with H not being in the commutant, of course I can make the computation. But what I'm really doing, I'm taking, w what I'm taking? Yes, but then I will take, I will, I will, I will make one leap, I mean, and this is what Ludwig was saying. So suppose, so, so what I'm taking is I'm taking H universe, D, H universe, where D was, say, this gamma I, D, I, right? Suppose, and this, 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 this will be in a couple of next slides, I'm taking, well, D, H tilde, which is, say, gamma 0, D, 0. I'm using, you know, the whatever Minkowski notation, but doesn't matter. Plus H universe, say, gamma I, the I, H inverse. So I'm taking it then, if this is not from the commutant, you no longer even with the spe twisted spectral triple. So what it means? It means you basically can take any operator. Because I mean, there, there's no rule. I mean, the commutators with the er elements of the algebra are not bounded. So I mean, uh, so I mean what, what is somehow, you know, the point of taking it? I mean. Why I'm taking the is from the commutant. I stay with the spectral triple. What it means? The commutant is unbounded. I can use many of the tools. For instance, I can, in principle, I can use Kolmoskovici local index formula. So, I mean, this will give me, I mean, this operator, since it's commutator bounded, its spectral properties are basically the same as spectral properties of D. If H is bounded, H inverse, this is positive element bounded from the commutant. So I can use the, I mean, basically all the machinery of Kohn Moscovici, I mean, for the localized index formula works. So I can compute what's the cyclic cos cycle. 
Well, of course I know that this represents a K homology class. And just by, I mean, simple arguments, I mean, continuity, I mean, you can, you can make a path. I mean, this is the same K homology class. But, you know, there's a lot, you know, the, the things in the background that work for spectral triples are there. So, you know, I, I, it, it, is, it is like considering sort of a different geometry within the same topology class. So, I mean, that, that, that's how I understand geometry. Geometry in the sense of Riemannian geometry, I mean, choosing different metrics, I mean, and choosing different Dirac operators, is like considering sort of a family of geometries within one class of some topology. Say, fundamental class of the manifold, whatever. I mean, th this is something like that. All right. So, you do the computations, and of course, this is, you know, computer assisted. And even for the computer, I mean, 5.43 seconds, I mean, it's like eternity. And uh, you can see that the terms to be manipulated is, the number of terms to be manipulated is uh, like something like 72,000. So, I mean, you, if you want to do it by hand, I mean, good luck. You get an answer, I mean, and basically you can write the answer, I mean, in a much better way. And this is, so this is basically the function. So, again, I mean, it resembles, I mean, what you got, I mean, there's something like this. Well, this is the, the usual trace on the non commutative torus. So the usual trace on the non-commutative torus is, of course, a trace. I mean, the trace is only algebra of non-commutative torus. I mean, here, H and, of course, it, all its der derivations are in the commutant. But the commutant of non-commutative torus is also non-commutative torus. So no problem with that. So what do you mean how it's computed? It's just. It's not in the, in the but it's in the commutant. Yeah, I mean, the trace extends to the commutant. I mean, this is not, not a big deal. So, I mean, this is trace. I mean, so this is the volume of this non-commutative torus, which, I mean, agrees with what you, what you got. I mean, of course. I mean, this is the, the, the Wojcicki residue. You can make it, you can rewrite it using the properties of the trace. I mean, the trace has a very nice properties of non-commutative torus. I mean, the closeness of the trace and so on and so forth. So, this is, this is basically the same, because, I mean, this is, you know, like pushing the Laplacian and using the closeness of the trace. So you have something like that. And now, I mean, comes the test. I mean, when I got this, I mean, I say, oh, dear, I mean, it doesn't look realistic. So you look towards the classical result and the classical result for the curvature on a conformally rescaled metric on a four-dimensional torus is something like that. Well, so it means, I mean, well, I mean, this is the classical result. So here is the result when you have, well, square root of g times are, roughly speaking. I mean, this is, I want to point out, I mean, that this is not really, I mean, you cannot single out the curvature. What you can single out is only the square root of g times curvature, roughly speaking. All right, so this is the classical result. So basically, I mean, I mean, it agrees. I mean, this is very nice thing. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and then, I mean, you can be brave enough I mean, having this sort of functional, this is a functional. So you have an element from the commutant of non-commutative torus, H. You have the, uh, the functional. So, you can, so I mean, it, it makes sense to ask, I mean, what, is the, what are the equations of motions? And you can, you can basically write them down. Yeah. 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 No. Oh. Ah, well, under the trace, yes, so yes. Trace, yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, yeah, I mean, J, J is, J. Yeah, because, yeah. This is the same computer, I mean, it, you know, the, I mean, the statement is. No, 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 no. The thing is, the thing is, I mean, you know, if you have a Dirac operator, which is the, I mean, the classical Dirac operator, and you make this sort of rescaling, and that's been, that, that's, that's also been observed by Conor Moscovici, this is, this is a genuine Dirac operator, not a real spectral field, but genuine Dirac operator for the usual thing, but for the commutant, it's like there. So, I mean, 
Oh, two dimension. Yeah, the two dimensional case is very very different. Yeah, this is four. All right. So uh, you can you can get the equations of motions with respect to the eight only. So I mean, what I'm making less. But then, I mean, let's do the following thing. So this will be leading, you know, to the evolution. So first, assume that we have something like a two-dimensional torus times S1 times another S1. I forget about one S1. It doesn't really matter. And assume that uh, what I have, I take H to be a very nice element, to be the exponential of some function of this T. T is from this S1. Later, I mean, again, I will make this leap, you know, to, by the, to, to, to the, to the non-Euclidean case, times p, where p is just, for instance, take it, and I just explain why, because, I mean, it will simplify quite a lot of things. I mean, exponential of that, I mean, it's nicely simplified, for instance. I mean, uh, power search for projection. I mean, this is one of the beauties of the non-commutative torus that you have inside non-trivial projections, which are very nice elements. I mean, so you have this projection. So we fix a two-dimensional non-commutative torus, take one circle which we forget about, and one circle which they plays the role of time, at the moment Euclidean time. And you can compute what is the action function in this case. And this action function, I mean, depends on some, you know, this cosmological constant, there's a tra trace of P, which, I mean, if you take the, the sort of generic, I mean, generator of the K1, K0 group could be theta, I mean, it will be theta. And depends on some other constant, which, which, which also depends on the projection P, which, I mean, is computable, but, I mean, it doesn't really matter. So, then you can make the final leap. I mean, again, I mean, this is poor man theory, but you, you make this leap. This is Giancarlo Vic. So, I didn't realize, I mean, he was Italian. So, we make the Vic rotation. Yeah. I mean, roughly speaking. Well, I mean, you can make it the other way around. I mean, I mean it's just a choice. You know, I made a choice. You know. So uh, then you have this, after big rotation, you have something like that. And I mean, you can, you can, you can, I mean, this, this will be like a differential equation, a very complicated differential equation for this function f of theta, f of, t, f of t. So you can, for instance, I mean, you know, what, I, what I'm saying is so the sort of line is, I mean, it's a poor man's model, but I mean, you can ask the question, I mean, suppose I have something like, you know, the initial, the initial thing of, uh, of uh, um, conformally deformed uh, torus, so some sort of metric which depends on this projection and some function on T, and I want to stay in the class of conformally, so I have some sort of, uh, uh, constraints which keeps me in this class and conformally uh, rescaled models only. So what is the equation of motion? What is the function of f that I can get? I mean, this is a reasonable question, so that it has un any, you know, significance. Well, after, well, after, after making the big rotation, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, after rotation it becomes R, but then this, this is like that. I mean, I, w I will comment on that, that you can make it, of course, I mean, using this thing that, that also was in the last talk. I mean, one can make it on R, I mean, from the very beginning. Now, one can check that there's a solution. I mean, you just put the equation of motion. I mean, actually, this is lit slightly lit more than equation of motion. You use the sort of energy zero constraint. I mean, this is like using energy zero constraint. And, I mean, you get... I mean, this is one example. I tested it for a couple of values of the parameters. I mean, of course, you can try to test it generically, but this is horrible. Uh, what it shows is it explodes. The function f. So it means, I mean, that when you start with this, I mean, the interpretation would be, when you start with a conformally scaled metric, when you have a slight, you know, this is, you know, sort of not very, very tiny, it's not zero at the very beginning, tiny, but tiny, you know, initial con initial value of this of this f. So, which is the the projection? I mean, if if the function f is zero, then you have this h being one. The rest is you know projection plus one plus something times projection. So, if you start with this tiny tiny value of this of this initial condition, then well, you can explode. So it means I mean the this 
you will you will have that this H, you know, something like goes basically, you know, weird or you know projects everything on this on this on this on this non-trivial module. I mean, interesting question because I mean, I mean this this is the point when you can can ask a question: Will the evolution in the on the non commutative spheres always be like that? Will it be always degenerate in a sense? Or can you make something? I mean, I got I got some some examples when you have some sort of oscillations. I mean, in the in the, in the meantime going on or something like that. But you know, these are the relevant questions. I mean, relevant question is I mean, how far is the evolution on some sort of non commutative toy model different from the classical one? I mean, here in the non commutative service, we have really fantastic things because we can w work with the weird things like projections in the algebra. So I mean, uh, well, H, H was e to the f of t p. So p is projection. Exactly, exactly. And then what I look, I mean, so the, the, the thing would be, since this is basically 1 plus, well, 1 minus 1 plus p times uh, uh, e to f t minus 1, right? Because I mean, projection is a projection. Then basically, if, the, if f of t explodes, then it means, you know, that this sort of projection on this, on this module, I mean, explodes. All right, it's a very simple module. But, you know, this is I, what I believe. This is a question, an example of a question which is both relevant and, you know, admissible. Admissible in things you can ask it, formulate it precisely, and you can try to get an answer. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. This is a very good point. Well, another thing, which, 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 is, some, which is something that you mentioned, I mean, you can consider breathing torus, which is something, you know, that, that came to my attention years ago talking to the Marseille group and especially Thomas Schucker, I mean, who said something, you know, posed the problem of a breathing non-commutative torus. So in a way you can you can you can address it in this in this language. So I mean in four dimensions three plus one you you just take this this thing. And then if this H is not from the commuter but from the algebra, you no longer with whatever twisted spectral triples or anything. So so you lose the notion of geometry anyway. But if this is from the commutant, you're still in the, in the geometry understood as, you know, spectral triple. So, uh, well, this could be done. I mean, I will not bore you with the, with the details. I mean, this is another project, I mean, that, that I've been doing. It is, I mean, the, the remark is, I mean, the computations and everything, it's like the asymmetric torus that Ludwig was presenting in two dimensions, but here it's in four. I mean, the only the difference, similar action, is just more complicated than, I mean, you know. Are there any reasonable solutions? I mean, okay, this is the, you know, interpret. So, I mean, I will maybe say something. Okay, okay. Some, some, some general classical uh, remarks. Sorry, yeah. Okay, yes. I apologize to Einstein, yeah. All right, so. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. So the thing is, for instance, I mean, how do you actually look at the curvature on some easy type of geometries, like if you take a manifold M versus one, and then five minutes, okay, so I try to be very, very quick. So, and then, I mean, you can express the curvature on the product using the curvature on, on M and using the sort of extrinsic curvature, which basically in the, in the case when you take a very, very simple metric, which is just, you know, say dt square here plus the metric here on m, then this is just a deriv derivative, minus one half derivative by, by t of this, uh, of the family of metrics on m. So what do you assume you have family of metrics on m, and then you can express it something like that you know, in, in this way. So basically, I mean, this is, this is the Euclidean version. You can have the version which is non-Euclidean. I mean, you just change the signs. I mean, that's, that's the only thing. So you can, you can basically do, generalize this expression in some sort of non-commutative way. And to generalize this expression in a non-commutative way, I mean, you just say, well, let's assume that I have 
some sort of family of, say, Laplace type operators on this product, say, manifold or even spectral triple. And you say you have something like a Laplace operator on a spectral triple, and, or say, non commutative manifold. And you construct something like that. This is a very naive operator. Why it's naive? Classically, it has torsion. But I mean, since non commutative, we don't know what is the torsion. I mean, just admit it. And then you can, you can just you know, try to say what would be the corresponding formula for something like the general Einstein-Hibern action, but you know, expressed in terms of this operator only. I mean, and then you can suggest something like that. So you take the, say, this, so assume this is a three-dimensional thing. So you take Bodicki residue and this three-dimensional stuff to the power minus one half. I mean, this is, this is how it should be. And then you can express the rest in terms of, well, the, this Laplace operator is derivative. So, I mean, and the same formula, I mean, sort of a more advanced but, but similar formula can hold for the Dirac operator as well. Then, what is the lesson that we learned? So, I'm coming shortly to the conclusions. So, still we have no idea what we compute. I mean, uh, basically, it is a curvature. It's somehow, like Ludwig said, dress curvature and some functional. So, notion about torsion. I have no idea, I mean, how to say what is a torsion. Volume form, well, this roughly, I mean, we, we might have an idea what's a volume, but a volume form itself, that, you know, that's the, that's the thing. Special cases are computable, generally. I mean, finding some solutions and finding something is a problem. Now, this has this been also, you know, posed the question, is there an algebraic way to compute curvature, like, you know, in the paper of Rosenberg? There's another idea, I mean, which, is again explored. I mean, link those algebraic things from the principal bundle. When you have the notion of connection, and part of the metric comes from the connection, and then algebraically you can con you can you you can for the connection on the modules, connection from principal bundles, you can compute the curvature. So link it to the curvature you compute that way. I mean, this is this is a challenge. And there's a fourth problem. There's a temptation to make non-commutative non-commutativity evolve. So for instance, you take a family of non-commutative tori with this theta parameter depending on t. Now, what goes wrong? So that's what I said. You take theta depending on t. What goes wrong? Well, there's two, two good reasons is a trap. First, the naive Dirac operator doesn't work. It has unbounded commutators. So the Dirac operator that, that was, for instance, written in in the previous uh, case, I mean, it doesn't work. And the second thing is, you know, it's not like changing geometry. Changing theta means changing topology. So, I mean, what we are doing we are really, I mean, that would be like evolution, but not only of geometry. <coughs> I mean, when you have something like, you know, Lorentzian manifolds, I mean, in this notion of foliation, global hyperbolic, or whatever, I mean, you have foliations, and those foliated things are basically the same topology. Here, you, you would be changing topology. Well, naive Dirac would be, would be something like, you know, gamma 0 d0 plus d3. Yeah. Yeah. Well, exactly. So take non commutative torus with theta depending on t, and you make a very special theta, for instance. So you take, uh, well, you take, you take this lambda to be e to the 2 pi i t. You get a very nice example of something which is, yep, yep, yeah, exactly, exactly. And you may get a very, very nice example of something which is quite well known. It's well known that the Dirac operator exists on it, so that there exists a K homology class, and also unbounded Fredholm module which exists on that. It gives a very good cyclic co-cycle, and it's been shown by Tom Hetfield. Uh, the question is to write it. So, okay, so I'm coming. So, is there a solution for this? I don't know. So, conclusions we need a good notion of geometry. We need to work out more examples. And instead of going Lorentzian, I mean, this is not, you know, criticizing. I mean, just think as, as was said by my, you know, pre speaker, so to say. There are so many notions of Lorentzian geometries, non commutative Lorentzian geometries, that you can get lost. So, 
The thing is, maybe it's time to start a modest idea to check whether naive, non-relativistic evolution of geometry makes sense. Computationally, is a tough job. But there are still many interesting questions. And I think, you know, this is a challenge, you know, to pinpoint those questions and, you know, to say something about the answers. And, well, can one really make it to do something useful? I mean, that's another thing, but it's also sort of a question, you know, to ask. So, thank you for your attention. Well, I mean, if you don't assume that P is a projection, uh, it, gets, it gets more and more complicated. I mean, you need to assume some sort of form of, of H, you know, to, to really do the computation, I mean, as far as I can see. In finite time, yeah. But the thing is, I mean, you, uh, yeah, you, you can minimize it, yeah, but, but there's, I mean, again, I mean, the problem is, I mean, of the minimality of the operator. Minimality of the operator, because, I mean, the, the, the thing is, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, uh, this is a challenge. No, topology, I mean, the, the, you know, there's more to geometry than only topology, or something like that. So, so, so geometry is something, you know, basically, I mean, if you change the Riemannian metric, you stay in the same topology class, or homology class. So, so I think, I mean, the real challenge is, you know, to understand those geometrical notions, to make sense out of them. And basically, I mean, you, you can do it by computing things. So that, that's, that's a challenge. And, uh, Then lunch. <laughs> <laughs>